how to overcome all of our dysfunctions, all of our problems. Yes, I'm going to address all these. I'm going to be taking multiple different issues like the quality of our relationships. Why are so many Americans addicted to so many things? And why do we succeed at some things and fail at others if we give both the same amount of intention and intensity of effort? It all begins by realizing that when we begin a journey, any journey in life or any transition from one part of life to another, we first have to decide what we're going to surrender. That means we have to take a moment and reflect. And this is something we have a hard time doing because we are hyperkinetic. We're distracted constantly, every waking moment. If we're not distracted, we seek distractions. We seek something to take us away from being present with ourselves. We'll want a phone call or we'll go eat something, even if we're not hungry. We'll watch something on television or we'll spend time on the computer. And then at the end of all this, what have we actually achieved? Well, we've created imbalance. Now, in a previous discussion, I talked about one of the keys of being healthy is being happy. In fact, in my counseling of tens of thousands of people, I've never seen someone who could be healthy until they were happy. Hence, happiness is the foundation upon which we should start our journey. Am I happy? And if not, why not? And that's where we have to say, what must I surrender now in order to gain something that is essential to me, more essential than what I thought? So if I had taken on a lot of beliefs that I now want to look at and say, hmm, was it really worth all that effort and time to work on A when I should have been working on B? Should I have gone to that university? Should I have taken those courses? Should I have gotten married that young or that late? Had this many children or no children? What if I choose to be alone? Am I lonely? Am I self-pitying? Am I depressed? And if so, by what measure? Why? What do I gain from my dysfunction? No one ever asked that. What do I gain from my anger? What do I gain from my judgmentalism of others? What do I gain from anything that would be perceived by normal and reasonable people as counterintuitive and counterproductive? Because anything that you give power to suddenly has power over everything else that's going on in your mind. And that's why we have so many people who are selectively functional. What do I mean? I mean that when it's required for our own survival to make intelligent or what seems like reasonable and intelligent and committed and disciplined decisions, we are good at it. Hence, we can do a job very well. And almost everyone does. Most people would do whatever they are mastering with some level of efficiency and quality. That doesn't mean that that is also with purpose. More often than not, the real purpose is because that job we need, it pays our bills, it gives us some sense of, of commitment to overcoming the deficiencies and not having a place to live, food to eat, clothes to wear, uh, money to socialize, go to school, anything we want. Money provides us and income provides us with that stability. But in the process of not asking, should I surrender the long journey, the longer commitment, the longer discipline, the longer introspection, the longer meditation about where I'm at at this section of my life, this crossroads of my life, for the short, the short get, where I'll get someplace now. But is it the right job? Is it the right relationship? Is it the right food you're eating? Is, are you in the right place? Are you thinking the right thoughts? Are you reading the right books? How are you using your time? Are you a happy person or unhappy? Are you committed to understanding what causes happiness and what causes a lack of contentment with life? These are serious issues. These are deeper issues. And we have a real hard time swimming in the deeper waters of life. We've gotten so used to superficiality that even our philosophers today uh, are not taking it deep enough. We, we have these people that we think are brilliant and they're more often than not some form of self-centered, narcissistic, uh, self-empowerment gurus. They're not there to really help people, I don't believe. I believe if people got better, that's good, but they're there for themselves. They're not deep thinkers. Everything's a euphemism. You know, everything, well, we, you know, let it go, you know, walk on forward, oh, glib. That doesn't tell anyone anything about what's really going on in the life and how to change it.
Why do you think so many people, once they get to a place where there's a crisis that they can no longer deny or hide, then something gets their attention. You need help, friend. You need help now. You're a brother, a sister, an uncle, a friend. You're someone at work. You're someone that you met in school and stayed in contact with, and now you know that person's got a problem. Maybe it's an addiction problem. Maybe it's a relationship problem. Maybe it's a, a problem of self. So you try to bring it to their attention. Can I help you? Oh, I'm okay now. I'm, I'm going to a meeting where other people are like me there. Is the meeting helping you? Yeah, it, it, there, there's, there's some good things. I mean, we go and we talk about ourselves. And we listen to other people talking about themselves. And what's the outcome? Well, we have to keep going back to the meetings over and over again. Well, then... If you're going because you're suffering from some addiction, alcohol, gambling, work, relationships, over-responsibility, you're burned out. What if the meeting and sharing your woe and your pain, what if it becomes just another form of addiction? And so what we have is we generally have people who have multiple problems, all simultaneously, but we parse our problems and try to categorize them, like we do so many of the things in life. We're not just one whole Gaia. We're not a part of all life with our life energy and flowing. We have compartmentalized, cut and diced and sliced until we are this, 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 we're this religion, we're Catholic or Jew or Muslim or an atheist, agnostic, a spiritualist, or we are a vegan or a vegetarian, or uh, we're on a particular diet, partially educated, highly educated. We're at some point in a career and trying to get further in that career. Why? Why do you need, why does anyone have to keep going up this ladder that doesn't exist? Because we're told there's a reward at the top of the ladder. You've been practicing medicine, dentistry, law, a professor for 20 years. Where are you in this spectrum? Where are you? Well, Whatever I make, I spend. And if I don't spend it, people in my life spend it. So are you wanting to do more, to gain more, so you can spend more? Did you stop and ask yourself, should I surrender this need to have an artificial standard of living that replaces the sense of who I actually am because I really don't know who I am. I don't know the value of my being. I only know the cost of maintaining some superficiality of self. We don't ask these questions. They're too deep. And they require us to actually stop everything, stop and go to neutral and say, my God, my life's a mess. But who knows your life's a mess? Most people, you'd never know there's a mess because on the outside, they've mastered functional reality. They function in the real world in ways that are acceptable, and they can have them plausible deniability. I'm okay. How you doing? I'm okay. You don't know if the person's okay. They don't even know if they're okay. And if they weren't okay, they know that no one else is going to come and help them at that moment, so you know they're not okay. You hide it. So what we do is we are very good at bearing that which does not work in our lives. We cannot control certain urges, certain impulses, certain thoughts. It's like one day we wake up and we're in the middle of a gigantic emotional minefield, and we're afraid to go off where we're at because... Boom. Oh, someone will see my insecurity. Oh, someone will see my lack of commitment. Oh, someone will see my deficiency. Oh, if I'm very successful, maybe people see I'm a fraud. I'm not really that good, special, brilliant person that the successful people want you to believe they are. And they are surrounded. Do you ever ask yourself, why do celebrities and not regular people are always afraid to show themselves, present themselves without being scripted, a teleprompter? I mean, my God, if you want to meet some of the dumbest human beings you've ever met in your life, meet successful people from the President of the United States on down. There's nothing real about them. 
Every single thing they say has to be scripted. They have to have focus groups, focus groups that tell them what to say, how to say it, how to look presidential. And then we buy that. Oh, did you see they look presidential? You've all heard that, right? Oh, he looks pre... What's that mean? It's a stupid word. It's, it's a stupid concept that has no meaning whatsoever. You're going to vote for someone, the most powerful person on the planet, that could destroy the planet, that could cause wars or peace based upon how they dress or how they look or the pen they wear showing they're an American or the color of their tie, does it match their suit? Have we become that superficial? Then we're the problem. Talk with someone. Just talk with anyone who's an expert about anything other than what they're an expert in. Oh, you're an immunologist? Show me where your vaccines have prevented children from dying of the diseases that you're vaccinating for. I'll show you how they're dying from the vaccines. Are you willing to acknowledge that? Are you willing to accept that? But you're willing to take the responsibility for the success if they don't die and don't get a disease. Was there anything else in the world that could prevent a person getting the flu except the flu vaccine? Yeah. A good diet, sunshine, vitamin D, vitamin C, positive attitude, good night's sleep, de-stressing, happiness, all that builds up your immune system. And therefore, you're less likely if you're exposed to any virus, and we're all exposed to viruses every day. There are hundreds of trillions of viruses in this world, in our immediate environment, in our own body. They're not all destructive, like not all bacteria is bad. In fact, the biome in your gut is made up of bacteria. And if you feed the body the right foods and clean foods, you've got healthy bacteria. Feed them toxic foods, hot dogs, hamburgers, french fries, pizzas, the average person's diet. Then you end up with bad bacteria. You end up with candida. You end up with all forms of imbalances in your biochemistry. Your body, 100 times a second, your body's trying to defend you from yourself. Isn't that amazing? Everything you do wrong, the body immediately tries to counteract that. You eat something that's wrong, it gives you diarrhea. If you're infected by something, it gives you mu mucus and has you cough it out and or create the phlegm that gets it out of the body. These are nature's way of helping protect us from ourselves. In fact, it seems like every day the average American has to have someone protect them from the choices they make. Now, is that being too harsh, too real? Can we handle that truth? We cannot. That's not what we want to hear. We want to hear how everything's possible and we can start over and just do it, just like addiction. I heard some person saying, addiction is because of childhood trauma. Well, it might be in some people. But what happens when you're an adult and you're no longer traumatized by what someone's doing to you? What if no one's doing anything to you? What if people are liking you? Are you now going to say, because I was traumatized 30 years ago, it justifies me you know, snorting cocaine? No. That's how superficial and such lack of depth in our thinking has become. Because it will not help a person just to bring them something that is self-evidently good for the body if what's up here in the perception of their reality says, I'm insecure, I don't know who I really am, I don't have a lot of confidence, I have uncertainty about a lot of things, so the moment a crisis occurs, I'm going to go right back to the way I was before I was here. I know that because I've seen how frequently people will revert back off a healthy program to a sick program. And so why would you intentionally see that you got so much healthier and better and then give it up and go back to being sick? Because there's something people get from their choices. So we have to ask ourselves, is life a series of compromises? And if so, what is the cost or benefit of each compromise? So when you can ask and answer that question, you begin to ask yourself, am I engaged in any addictive behavior? Because science and medicine and social sciences like us believe that all addictions are biochemical imbalances, a disease that can be easily categorized and therefore, oh, you've got this disease, you've got this illness, we have to give you this medication, this protocol, it's all paid for because it's all been put in the great register of healing modality. But all of it's garbage. Nobody's ever been healed from anything within psychiatry using their pharmacological uh, panaceas. No, the, you know, Valium, Prozac, Paxil, electroconvulsive therapy, uh, lobotomy. So then they become the, the holders of truth 
it's understood that you defer always to the sanctity of truth to those in a higher position. So what if then starting our new journey, we just decide I'm willing to sacrifice believing in everything and then reform my beliefs based upon actual, in the moment, understanding. That would be a very, a very unusual way of looking at life, but a very successful one in my opinion. We do not appreciate that when we make a choice, we frequently have not surrendered its opposite choice. And hence we can flow from good decisions to bad decisions, smart decisions to stupid decisions. We can flow between constructive to destructive in that quick. And that confuses us because we like to think that's a good person. You mean they're good all the time, some of the time, a little bit of the time? Or that person's a bad person. Are they bad all the time, sometime? So ask yourself, in all of the compromises you make, what do you gain from making a bad choice? So when someone robs a bank, it's a bad choice when they get caught, but it's a good choice for them if they're not. When a person's committing adultery, it's a good choice when they're not caught. It's a bad choice when they're caught. When someone's lying, good when they don't get caught, bad when they get caught. Greed, it's a torrent running through the entire corporate industrial complex, all industries, governmental agencies, technocrats, just unmitigated greed. What do you gain by being greedy? Well, you gain the presumption of power Someone now is going to defer to you. Oh, that guy is rich. Did you, did you see what he owns? And suddenly it's what, what the wealth provides you with. Access to other people who are wealthy. Now you can have anything you want, but now you have to guard the image. So the image is, well, that's a, that's a wealthy person, so you have to act wealthy. You can't just have a lot of wealth and no one know it. If you have a lot of wealth and stayed in the same home, same street, same city that you grew up in, how would anyone know that you are wealthy or famous or you have power? So we have this infantile behavior syndrome in the United States where grown adults have to act out as if they're more significant than other grown adults because that's how we select those that we want to lead us. Oh, that person is a born leader because they're decisive. Go in and do this and this. And my God, what's that telling us? What if their leadership is based upon making irresponsible or in non-humanistic choices? What if they're just making really bad choices, invading countries, starting wars, promoting racism, misogyny, disempowering people, creating not just income inequality, but power inequality? social inequality, ethnic inequality, educational inequality, genetic inequality. Because once a person has that power and they're not mature, then they know not the value of power in a positive position, but they do know the power that they're given can allow them to exceed anyone else's authority to stop them. And hence we have unbridled greed. Corporate America has a charter. Every corporation in America is allowed to operate with a charter that allows them to be treated as if, if they do something wrong, they can pay a fine, that's the cost of doing business, but nobody goes to jail, no, no reputation is destroyed, and they can move forward. You're gonna have up around, somewhere around 35 million Americans unemployed because you have to include all the people who before this couldn't find work or had to work part-time two or three jobs and people just gave up, stopped looking for jobs. They're not even included in these figures. So that means that a lot of people don't have the money to live. They don't have the money to pay bills. And yet all the bill collectors are going after them. There's been no forgiveness for people who can't pay their, their bills. So now people who are at home in quarantine will now not be able to pay their rent and hence can be thrown out, won't be able to pay their mortgage, lose their house, won't be able to pay, buy for food. So what are we supposed to do with someone, uh, millions of someone who can't buy food? Now you think that would be a priority. It's not. For rich people, greedy people, people who have isolated themselves by stating, 
I can live here, you can't. I can, I can have everything I want, and you can't. And so that means that, that person has to ask themselves, what did I compromise to get this wealthy? What did I compromise to care so little and have no empathy for others who have so little? What did I compromise? What is the value of my position now versus if I were more humane? They don't have to ask that question because no one's going to ask it of them. Because once you start aligning yourself with compromising integrity, ethics, and honor for comforts, you've taken the short choice not looking at the long-term consequence because there's a short-term and a long-term consequence to every choice you make. Lie today, get away with it. Tomorrow, you may be held accountable for it. So I would be embarrassed to be in someone's estate when they, billionaires, would not think about what could we do to get food for people who need it. I think that would be a reasonable thing to do, would you? You know, share, share what you have doesn't take away what you have, but you're giving to other people. They don't think that way. That's not how the rich think in the United States. Hemingway said, as did F. Scott Fitzgerald, the rich are different. Yeah, they are not from you and I. From their authentic self, they're different. They've separated themselves. They're, they're, they're uncomfortable. They want to be in denial of who they were before they became famous. I've counseled a lot of very famous celebrities. And there were two groups of celebrities that I counseled. Ones were from old Hollywood and uh, up through the 1960s, then most retired, and then the newer ones. And the older ones were a lot classier, a lot nicer. They were very unpretentious. They were very just down to earth. Yes, they had power, but it was amazing to hear how they used it. All of them were helping different groups. All of them were sponsoring artists and people, and they never lost that sense of of empathy for others and joy in helping others. They were passing on their gifts. Today, you don't see that. And, uh, and they talk about what it was like, you know, when they didn't have things, you know, and the comparison to when they do. They just have different senses of responsibility. But they never lost track of who they were. They didn't make that compromise. I have to be a different person for the public or for the society I'm in, or they'll reject me. They didn't care. A lot of them were very cutting-edge feminists. And, uh, and it was just, it was wonderful for me, a, you know, a young guy from West Virginia that had never seen any of these kind of people, to be with them and that I could never meet these kind of people. I wouldn't even know who they were uh, in real life. And yet there I was. I was learning about life. And these people were happy. And the key to that was happiness allows a fertile soil to grow everything from. So that's where you start. Well, how are you going to be happy if you're in the wrong relationship? Because now the focus of your life is like a person that has cancer or heart disease or diabetes. Every day you wake up and you, you're, you're carrying this monster disease in your psyche that takes up all of your energy, it absorbs everything in the room. So you have to make something else more important than your disease or its process. You have to make your life and what you still have to live for. And for that, you have to realize that don't make any decision that can end up throwing you back to what you don't want to be. Even if it's something in the moment you feel good in the moment, but you can later regret. Simply say no to that. I don't want to have any regrets. So if I think well about the ultimate outcome of any choice I make, then I'm more likely than not to make the right choice because I'm also using intuition. Then I want to ask myself, well, if I'm making the right decision about my life and my choices, by necessity, I'm going to have to exclude a lot of the stuff that I have now in my life. So then you have to make a list of things you no longer want in your life and just check them off. Don't need that now. Even if it was something that benefited you or you wanted previously in your life. You have to be willing to surrender stuff. You just can't keep accumulating everything in your life. There's an old Chinese saying that goes something like this. If you're going to travel far, travel light. And we do just the opposite. We have too much stuff. We have too many responsibilities. We have too much emotional baggage. 
and we have too many different addictive behaviors. And what is a real addiction about? What if a person just got up and say, hi, I'm Gary. Um, I'm not an addict. Uh, I'm just a person that made some stupid choices because in the moment I was making those choices, I got away with it. Right? And then I just got used to making the easy choices, hang, picking all the low hanging fruit, and never realizing there'd be a day when I couldn't reach the higher fruit that I needed. And so, yeah, whether it was drugs or gambling, um, I just, I decided I like this. I'm gaining something from it. So my compromise was I'm getting something that's making me feel better in this moment, uh, more exciting than my normal life. Maybe I live a boring life. And so I made bad choices. That's a me measure of my character. So if my character is what has to be challenged, then I should challenge my character, not the addiction. The addiction comes from the bad choice. It is not the cause of the choice. And we've got it exactly the opposite in our entire society. We start off by taking the person in as if somehow they have a disease, like a cancer, and they have to be treated as if they have no responsibility for it. In fact, we're not even allowed to talk about their responsibility because that's shaming the, the victim. Well, what if the victim is the victim because they made themselves a victim? Can we not be mature enough to accept that if you keep screwing up, you're the cause of your problem? So don't look over there or there or out there. Don't triangulate other people as your problem. You're the problem. You're the solution. There's a consequence to not accepting responsibility. And it doesn't mean because you accept responsibility you have to beat up on yourself. It's not about self-flagellation. It's not about, uh, about you know, creating a low sense of self-esteem. It's not martyring yourself. It's just being honest. You made bad choices because none of those people who became alcoholics were an alcoholic at the beginning. It's something they adapted that lifestyle into their life. But we'd like to believe this, not our responsibility. Well, if it's not your responsibility, whose is it? And then that's where you start seeing the corporatization, the profiting, the commodification of all disease, even ones they have to make up to justify how they can feed at that trough. So well, they don't make a lot of money from you. Sick, they make a fortune. Deadly sick, they make big bucks. Just go into any emergency room and see what it costs you. See how much benevolence and charities in the average for profit hospital emergency room. If you want to have a good relationship, what is the big picture of your life? What is the purpose of a relationship? For companionship, for sensuality and intimacy, to have a friend, to have, have someone that you can harmonize some of your beliefs and values? Well, there is no such thing as a perfect relationship because in every person, there's a need to still maintain a sense of autonomy, meaning that which is uniquely our own, but willing to share things. So shouldn't you have some discussion about what you like about yourself that you're willing to share and what you don't want to share with someone because it could interfere with the quality of what else you're sharing. So what if right up front, you took your time to sit with someone and say, what do we have in common that we can enjoy together? And, and then you're honest, just be honest. And because if you can't be honest at the beginning of a relationship, then you're hiding the truth. That's one of those emotional minds that you've planted that's going to pop up later. Don't assume that a relationship is your right to make someone over into your needs or image or desires. You have no right to do that. And don't place yourself in a situation to have someone believe that you're more than what you are because that's going to put stress on you to try to match some unrealistic needs. And yet all the time people do it, don't they? People trying to be something they really aren't, but they are, feel an obligation to do things. But if they were given their others, they wouldn't. Well, then just be honest about it. Don't allow the crisis of incompatibilities destroy a relationship after it could have been done at the beginning right and now you've taken everything for granted, assuming everything will be all right, and not working on it. And what happens is most people, most people lie about the need for their relationships. It's better to be honest. If you're lonely, 
then why are you lonely? What in your life requires you to be lonely? Is there no one else you can befriend? Are you seeking for people? What kind of people are you seeking? Is that person going to take away the loneliness? Have you ever met anyone who is lonely by themselves who is any less lonely in a relationship? Doesn't happen, does it? That loneliness within the self is there for a reason. Shouldn't you work on your insecurities, your incompleteness, your compromised self before you go into a relationship and get the help you need? And then when you have more confidence and comfort with, with yourself because you're no longer as limited as you once felt, no longer as insecure, then you have a lot more strengths and, and beautiful things to share in a relationship. And now you're harmonizing. And harmonizing, the majority of the time, makes it great. But unfortunately, we almost always go into relationships for the wrong reasons. And people are in their best behavior, showing us the best side of themselves to get us in. That's the bait. And then we're like, like a fish. We, we took the bait. And so if you see you've made a mistake, just let it go. Apologize and say, it's not you, it's me. I'm taking responsibility, but this isn't a relationship I can be in. It's about asking what was there that you didn't see or chose not to see. And how many times have there been red flags in your life and you chose not to pay attention to them? So we have to know ourselves well enough to be comfortable and confident to share the best of ourselves with another human being and keep that which is not resolved out of that. There are no perfect people, and we shouldn't expect perfection. And sometimes we think because someone looks really good or someone's intelligent or successful at what they do, that somehow that's, that's, that's the whole person. No, it's not. There is no perfection. None. Far from it. So if you want to have a healthy relationship, first you have to be healthy yourself. If you want happiness in a relationship, you have to be happy. You can't be unhappy and expect someone else that seems and maybe is happy to be your happiness. Show that you're willing to let go of what prevents happiness, prevents completeness, com prevents maturity. And then, then you have a chance to be in someone's life. So Occam's razor, go to the heart of an issue because it's almost always the best answer, the simplest answer is the best answer in most cases and just say, here's who I am, and lay it out. People accept it or reject it. Better have someone reject it, and at least not get yourself into one of these tumultuous and, and uh, very negative, toxic relationships. But let's say that it's the other side. Let's say it's positive. Good. Now, understand that everything has an expiration date. Every day you're awake, and someone else this is in your life, show honor that. Show them every day that you really appreciate the gift that they have given you by giving themselves to sharing in your relationship. Never take a person for granted. Never take that wonderful heart energy, all that love that they're emanating, and you're just there bathing in it. The joy, they're smiling, you're smiling. The energy you share, they exchange a positive energy, the heart energy, the mind energy, because one day that will end. At what point in your life do you have the courage to challenge false assumptions. Assumption is that there's only one truth in politics, and that's who's ever in power has got the interest of everyone at stake, and therefore I have to trust them. That's a false assumption. All you have to do is deconstruct all of the identity politics, all of the hatred they have for you if you're the opposite party supporter. Well, therefore, they're not looking after your interests. If you're a farmer, they're not, a small farmer, they're not looking after your interests. If you're a large farmer, corporate farmer, who gave corporate donations, they're interested in you. You're the one that's going to get bailed out, not the small farmer. If you're a small business person in New York, the landlords own, the, own all of real estate in New York. They rule because they've given money to the city council members and the state legislatures. So now little business people are going broke. 37% of all small businesses in New York City and the boroughs are out of business. No, they're all in debt and they just can't 
throw any more money at a problem that's insurmountable. So imagine then that the people who serve most people are the ones least served themselves. But the big people, Wall Street, the hedge funds, the equity partners, the military industrial complex, all these other, they'll all get tons of money, trillions of dollars. I'm guessing it'll go probably from four trillion, now it'll go up to about eight to 10 trillion dollars. This will be the largest exchange of money in world history. And then they will buy corporations for dollars. They'll have massive amounts of wealth and they also can accumulate debt without it adversely affecting them. You and I accumulate debt, we're stuck with it. You and I break a rule, we're held to one standard. They break a rule, there's a different standard. So understand until you have the courage to look at these assumptions you've been living by, you won't fully appreciate how much you've compromised in order to be a part of that particular belief. And there's gonna be a time when you should start to question all assumptions all assumptions in life. Because otherwise, what are you trading off? You're trading off happiness without, without needing a standard of living and having a quality of life for having only a standard of living and no quality of life. Therefore, you're chasing happiness. If only I got further up on that ladder, if only I got more power, if only I got more, a bigger contract, if only I had something more than what I have now, I would have happiness. It never works. We're always trying to buy happiness or chase happiness. instead of realizing we are happiness. We just have to liberate ourselves from all the false assumptions that disguise and limit our own expression of happiness. So a happy relationship, a happy person within a happy relationship, this person is going to live a longer life. They're going to have more meaning to life because they're grounded. There's a center. There's a grounding that allows them to make better choices and they think through their choices. What is the ultimate outcome? Now, I've given several principles over the last five years, and a few later than that. I've given the principle of intentional neglect in every assumption, every belief, every ritual, every dogma, every creed, everything you live by, you have to ask yourself, can I deconstruct this? Can I show that I've been living by some false pretense? And hence, what have I given up that is essential to my well-being and what did I gain in return? A position within society, a position within a hierarchical order, an artificial hierarchical order? What did I give up? How much did it cost me? What did I gain in the short term? What did I lose in the long term? Those are the questions we should be asking ourselves because those are the root of a lot of other problems. So when we realized, gee whiz, I wasn't living a complicated life, then I started to get successful and the more success I got, the more complicated my life became. Until one day, all I was doing is trying to maintain some semblance of a balance in an overly complicated life. Well, how about uncomplicating your life? How about deconstructing your life? How about realizing how much of what you've gained you should surrender? Remember what I said at the beginning? Before you start a journey, make a list of what you're willing to surrender. And all notions of living a non-authentic life should be surrendered. Rituals that you no longer believe in, surrender. False relationships, surrender. Obedience to authority, surrender. Pledging your allegiance to corporations that have no allegiance to you at all, surrender. If you did that, then one day you're gonna wake up and you're gonna be a lot happier and healthier. Then you won't need to act out through addictive behavior because once you get into that addictive behavior, it seems easy at the beginning. Everyone I've ever counseled, thousands of people called addicts, who are now tied into their drugs, tied into their alcohol, tied into their gambling, tied into their risk-taking, tied into being obsessively responsible for other people. Well, one day, they no longer have control over their addiction. They are living what we now would consider in the stereotypical sense, a purely addictive existence. They wake up in the morning and the whole thing on their mind is comfort coming from that addictive behavior. And but it didn't start that way. 
You take a person that's happy, you take a person that's living in balance, you're taking a person who's thinking through things by intentionally looking for the truth. Intentional awareness equals intentional enlightenment. That allows you intentionally positive choices. Intentional neglect, on the other hand, leads you to intentional ignorance of the facts, which leads you to intentional negative outcome. The best example of that would be that not one of the people that I interview who now are living with a vaccine injured person themselves or their children more often than not, not one was anti-vaccine. It was only after the fact. That it's like a person that won't stop eating the hamburgers and drinking the alcohol until they have their heart attack or smoking cigarettes. They won't stop until they have their lung cancer or emphysema. And so by the time that happens, then our whole life is adversely affected. And now it's controlled by the circumstances. The unintentional consequence of intentional ignorance. But think of all the people who haven't had a vaccine injury in their family. They're the ones who are lined right up because they're obedient to authority because they took the short term molding and solidifying their own values and beliefs within that structure that is supposed to give them some sense of guidance in life. So the very people, very institutions we trust are the very ones who are quickest to sell us out, use us, commodify us. And then we feel like we're a victim. Of what are you a victim? Of wrong choices because you chose to be intentionally ignorant instead of intentionally educated and aware. And that brings us to the concept, when should I start my change? Well, that's a big one because most people have to have a lot of motivation or fear to make any changes. They resist. And that brings me to the concept of you can always know where someone's going in life by their constraints. So the moment you know their constraints and you know that they're always going to be doing this, I'm not sure. I'm not ready. I don't want to take any risks. I'm, I'm afraid of losing something. As a result, they don't change. They'll do little itty bitty things, but they won't change. You know, it, they'll bring some little thing into their life so that they can appease their guilt by saying, well, I'm doing something. I'm, you know, I'm drinking orange juice. I'm, yeah, but you're drinking alcohol at the same time. All right, so what are you really doing? And we live this duality. We, I, we want to be this side of the equation, and yet all of our choices are this side. The positive we desire, the negative controls us. Hence, the negative ultimately is going to collapse everything else. And that's the next concept. Whatever is the dominant way you're actually living, mind you, not thinking, not thinking. Everybody can think. It's what you do. And the more things you do positive and confidently, the more you start gaining trust that the way you're doing it, what you're doing is beneficial. And therefore, you become what you do. And you are what you do not what you think. What's holding you back? What are you afraid of gaining? A sense of complete authenticity because you would then have to deconstruct virtually almost everything in your life and re-examine its value. And a lot of the things you had one time valued and thought was so important, you will now see were just illusionary. And you believed it. Think of all the GIs who were damaged, tens of thousands, legs blown off, people coming back in body bags. How many of them realized too late they were fighting a rich man's war, had nothing to do with peace, or protecting America it had to do with profiteering, oil, minerals, geopolitics, regime changes. That's the only reason we have wars. But those people believed in the wrong things. And there's a consequence to the wrong beliefs. They never stopped and deconstructed the value of that belief. And so we're questioning everything. We're deconstructing everything to see what is of substance and what is not what is real and what is false. When you live by illusion, then you become an illusion. 
and you forget who you really are and forget that you're no better than anyone else. You shouldn't act as if somehow you're unique in anything other than the talent you project. And mind you, almost all that is written and directed, lit and staged by other people, all, all creating the illusion of what is real when it's not. We have to live real lives. There's a real consequence. You know, everything in our lives, you know, is what it is. And we've all experienced that. You know, and this is, this is how life is, but we can't handle life the way it is. So we have to make it seem like some people have it better and some people worse. All the reality shows, do you ever notice how vulgar they are, how demeaning they are, how sarcastic and bitter and competitive? That's not the way most people live. Most people are relatively decent human beings. They just want to get along. They're not out there screaming and yelling. Those are staged. And unfortunately, what happens when you don't realize how much of life is staged, how much is just false? So when you get down to what is really necessary, go to right to what you need to be, what you need to think. Go to the place in your life where you find out what the real meaning of your life is and how you can now act upon it. If I know what my meaning should be, I should have the confidence and courage to develop the tools to make that happen. And yes, there will be crisis. Yes, there will be things that don't work. Yes, there will be things that I think, my God, why am I doing this? That's all part of the new learning curve. You're at the bottom of something new. You're writing a new story. The new story is going to have a completely different uh, writing than the previous one because in the previous one you wrote the story about your life based upon having people pay attention to you. So you either exaggerated stuff or you self-deprecated yourself. You either became a victim so other people could identify you who were also victims and therefore suffer together or you, you exaggerated the relevance of what you've done. You live life by hyperboles or you didn't want to do any of that in which case you stayed in that middle zone and the middle zone doesn't get any attention. Only that which exaggerates itself gets attention. The very wealthy get attention, the poor, none. No, long, long before we had drug addicts and people defecating on the streets of Los Angeles and San Francisco, we had poor. We chose not to deal with it. Long before we had charter schools, we had the deterioration of the value of the curriculum with too much administrators and, and gagging the teachers from being able to teach the way they authentically knew and historically had created classrooms of critical thinkers. Long before we had utterly corrupt politicians at every level, we had men and women who wanted to change society to make it a better place for everyone. Saw what we needed in Ralph Nader who made that happen. Today we've deconstructed everything that we once valued. Everything from morals and manners and etiquette to critical thinking and learning to sharing and community awareness and service now community service is what a person gets when they get out of prison or keep from going to prison. It says something that all of us should be actively engaged in with pride, something you do for your community. Now we have people don't want to be in a relationship because they've seen decades of destroyed relationships and the fallout, which is toxic. It's like radiation, emotional radiation from these relationships, the acrimony, the, the insensitivity, the expulsion of all that they kept secret and sacred within that relationship is now vomited out into the public arena to show this is what I had to deal with. Well, why didn't you stop it? Why did you get into it? What responsibility do you have for having been there? But that's not something we look at. Remember, your conditioning will distort all reality. Your need to have your ego, silent ego inward, or a strong external alpha ego in male and female, it distorts all reality. And therefore you're not listening to what's being said, you're not understanding what's being said, and you're not changing because of what is said. They can help you because you're guarding and defending what you have achieved, whatever it is. All of our life then becomes the more we accumulate, the more we stay stationary because we're afraid of losing what we have and therefore we protect it. And then one day you wake up and think, my God, I'm afraid to look back. I'm afraid to learn any lessons from my past. The only lessons I've carried forward are my pain. 
Well, that's exactly the one lesson you should surrender. Your pain. The pain of indifference, the pain of lack of discipline, the pain of understanding. And instead, say, I have to look back to see what I don't want to take forward with me. I want to start a new chapter, and I don't want to make compromises in the short term that I'll regret in the long term. So instead of making compromises, why don't you transcend problems by understanding how strong you are, how insightful you are, how wise you are, and make some positive changes. Instead of saying, I got to work on this problem, I got to work on this problem, I got to work on this problem, I can't do anything because of the problem. No, that problem is an illusion, more often than not. It's based on fear and insecurity. Why not simply say, I'm going to do something, and I'm going to keep doing it, and every day I'm going to do more of it, I'm going to do more of it, I'm going to do more of it until the day comes. I'm not afraid of that anymore. Now I've conquered that. I've conquered that fear. I've conquered the fear of exclusion. I've conquered the fear of in insecurity. I've conquered the fear of incompleteness. I'm a complete person who's happy. Now I want other people in my life who are happy. I want other people in my life who will respect me for who I am and me for them. People who can show me they deserve to be in my life and I deserve to be in their life. That is a good relationship. That's a good life. Now you can laugh at yourself and find joy. Even though you're in a crisis, you're not the crisis. And you're in chaos, you're not the chaos. Thank you all for listening.